nothing too crazy happening, which sets the perfect stage for us to go back and forget about market profile, forget about crazy indicators, forget about Fibonacci, forget about all this stuff, and reframe things down to the very essence of stuff. And I find that this is a great exercise to do periodically because um, you guys probably know um, so well how much stuff there is out there on the internet, in the feeds, in the social media, and so forth and so forth. And it's a little bit misleading sometimes in that you know, it's very easy to be selective and post the good examples and the things that work with omitting the stuff that doesn't or the noisy periods or the slower choppy periods like today that may just add a little bit of stirred up silt to the waters, right? And um, I really should have titled this presentation so you've been trading for 30 years, more or less, and you're still confused. Because <laughs> the truth of the matter is, I mean, that happens to me. There's not always perfect, clean, well-defined setups. But what we do find is that the heavier the volume, the better the setups or structure is defined. And in the very meantime, I wanted to just go back um, to an exercise that should be extremely helpful if you've only been in the markets for a year or if you've been in the markets for 40 years. It's always good to remind ourselves and center ourselves back towards the simplicity of what is um, it, what really works. And I was scrolling through uh, my email at lunch, which I do, and I subscribed to one blog. I, I think I only subscribed to two blogs, uh, and, and they're sort of motivational stuff. And one of them is James Clear, who wrote that book called Atomic Habits. And this just sort of struck me as sort of being appropriate for today. It doesn't matter how successful or unsuccessful you are right now. What matters is whether your habits are putting you on the path towards success. You should be far more concerned with your current trajectory than with your current results. And we always need to remind ourselves about this in the markets because uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of emphasis placed on the monetary numeric values and instead it should be really thought of as your overall process and your lifestyle and how we go about looking at the charts and doing our analysis. And if you put it in that perspective without thinking about your trading results, it can really be a delightful journey, even if we look at the most simplistic things. And so what we're going to start off looking at today is price and levels. And um, I thought this was important, especially uh, because there are so many um, more traders that use market profile. And every morning on Twitter, I post a chart that my husband, Damon Pavlados, puts out uh, on the S&Ps. And you'll see that he has levels marked off that could be the point of control or areas where there hadn't been much volume trading. I'm not, uh, uh, I, I don't use market profile myself as much, but I do understand the concepts and they're all very valid. And the first thing you will notice about people that do use market profile, and there's actually quite a number of them on, on the internet and social media sources, is that most of the lines that are drawn are horizontal lines. And um, this is very different from drawing the, you know, diagonal sloping trend lines, which I promise you if I draw, I'll have to redraw and then redraw and then redraw again. And there's not quite as much significance about if a line is penetrated or not, although it is extremely useful for creating those channels. So I wanted just to start off with how much value we can gain from horizontal lines at, at certain points 
as dorky as that might sound, and then we're going to take it from there. So um, let's just start off and look at this very basic chart here. I, I normally don't use candlesticks. I use bar charts, but I thought that this showed the actual bar a lot easier. And um, I'm not one of those people that tries to interpret each of the candles either, such as uh, I know many people like to use Al Brooks bar by bar and, and you know, read into the meaning behind different candles. And it's, it's relatively obvious when you get a price rejection spike, meaning a fat tail or something like that. But my main purpose in starting with these types of charts was just to take this overall picture and start adding some structure to it in a different way than I normally do. And if you have seen, um, many of my past uh, presentations, which I have done for Big Mike, and also I have a, a YouTube channel on my website that includes all my uh, free material that will keep you um, about uh, as long as the Game of Thrones series, you know, watching. Uh, <laughs> it might not be as entertaining as the Game of Thrones, but, you know, it can occupy a good deal of your time. But you you guys know that I'm normally a swing high and a swing low person, so I like drawing the waves in a very classic sense. That's how I was... Um, how I, I evolved. And so what we're going to do this time around is look at levels and see how these come into the market on some different uh, markets and time frames. And this is going to be our departure point. And from here, we're going to add some variations such as looking at pockets. And the reason why this is important is, of course, um, you know, me being a, 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 an eternal student of George Douglas Taylor, who always talked about the price action around previous days, highs and lows, um, and a number of classic technicians from GAN to Dow to Wyckoff, all based a lot of their structure around the swing highs and swing lows. And from there, we can we can uh, draw conclusions on patterns and so forth. Um, but here, we're going to start off with the horizontal lines. And my very good friend, Terry Lieberman, who um, produces that window profile uh, software. What is it? Window? Window trader. Window trader software. That's... Um, what I, I post on Twitter each morning. And um, he likes to draw the lines, and of course you can get the, the program to automatically do it for you, you know, the big fat nodes and the low nodes, and he calls them decision points. And so a lot of what we're doing in the marketplace is watching these very key decision points or critical levels, usually they're very visible levels in the marketplace, and we're watching how the action trades around there, and these are the areas that tend to offer the best risk reward. So right now, we're just going to identify the levels. We're not necessarily talking about entries and strategies and triggers and, and tactics at this point. Let's just get the very basic of levels down. So what I did with this chart here is, on the left-hand side, I just simply circled uh, key uh, rising lows. And you can see that um, only on, on this far left uh, second one did we have two data points. So what I want to do is first mention that this very bottom orange line that I drew in, I could not draw that in until it was tested. So you can't technically have a support or a resistance level until you have two data points, all right? That's really important. And then hey, you can Linda. say you have resistance. Yes? I hate to break in, but we're, st we're getting the flashing again. We are getting the flashing again. Let me try one more thing. Did that make it any better? We'll keep going and see. It's not flashing at the moment, but... 
I had another window open, so that might have been the problem. Okay, well, let's see what happens. Okay, if one more time, then it's easy for me to switch to another computer. Let's see if we can just make a go with this. Back to what I was saying, support and resistance, right? The basics of all technical analysis, support and resistance. And then from there, we take the trend. But I just wanted you to see that each of these lines that was drawn, even if I had to draw it at a later point in time, at least captured two data points that formed resistance or two data points that got support. And uh, I, I'm gonna move on and hopefully make sure that we don't get any flashing. And now I added one more ingredient here, these blue circles, which are extremely important in the trend. And obviously I didn't draw in all the blue circles on the chart, but this is what my husband liked to call pockets, okay? And a lot of times you've seen the market trade back up into one of these pocket areas. It doesn't quite make a full retest up. And you'll see that happen in particular in trending markets. But they also are key areas where there's better risk reward for watching our trades. So let's just move on here. And now we can start to see how the market traded around some of these levels. So for example, if I simply take my little uh, drawing tool, which is right here, and uh, you can see where we, whoop, 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 whoop. okay. You can see this, this trade right here into this pocket area was initially met with resistance and at least led to a scalpable reaction down. Now, mind you, this is on a 240 minute time frame, um, but even so, it led to at least a 40 handle drop down off of that. Not that you're gonna necessarily capture all of that, but it was a, a good spot to look for initiation. And then same thing here on this purple circle. I usually do purple circles where we didn't quite get the full retest up, but you can see the tails that were in this pocket area. So, so far we have our single swing lows, which don't necessarily mean a whole lot. Then when you have a test or a data point, you can call it support or resistance. And that line becomes a lot more important looking out into the future. And along the way, we have our little pocket areas. And I know you're going, ah, geez, you know, this is so basic so far, but we're gonna continue and we're going to build on this. Um, because so much of our trading is really everybody watching the same movie, as I say. Everybody sees the same gap areas. Everybody sees the same swing highs and lows. And therefore, how the price acts at those levels is incredibly important. So let's... Uh, I hate the break back in. It's, no! Yes, it's flashing again. Not a problem, not a problem. I'm going to uh, have Kyle stick this up on his computer. It's just under uh, under your Dropbox 2019. And then I'll just plug in, you've got a mic over there too. So just uh, I'm just gonna key, continue blabbing away. And if it's flashing, um, I have no idea why that is doing it. Um, we have actually, you're using GoToWebinar, right? Yeah, it's like I said, it's like it loses focus for half a second, comes back. And for those uh, typing, I uh, the, the big issue is on the recording. We just want to make sure that the recording as well is easy, easy to see. So bear with us okay. for a minute while we get this little thing taken care of. Well, we'll get it fixed up. Don't worry. We got all the time in the world. And uh, have you considered using Zoom at all in the future? We are, we've looked at a few, but there's different aspects that I can't discuss on the air that we'd like. Not and, a big and deal. Like. And okay. This the, is the, the nice uh, thing this is, is one that does it. <laughs> nice thing is, is that, uh, you know, we're so far advanced than we were 15 years ago, right? Absolutely. 
Okay, I mean, the chart's still a chart. I can't necessarily say that the technical action has uh, advanced in the same rate that the uh, technology has. I mean, it's still a bunch of swing highs and swing lows. If anything, uh, it, it seems to get noisier in certain periods. But um, I, if, if it's okay, I'll just, con I'll just continue on here. Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay, and then, and then my... Uh, my right hand man here is is loading this up on his okay so we talked about um if i just go back this was a resistance level because here you only see one data point right but this was actually a resistance level from two data points if i actually go back there okay so uh it, it, it was a valid line at the time. And what I want to point out, first of all, is that we are still forming these pocket areas. And these become more critical when you start to trend, okay? Because you never fully retest the previous swing lows, right? That's why people draw their diagonal rising trend lines. But a better secret is to actually note the circles, these pocket areas, as I call them, and, uh, and then look for, uh, let's see, okay look for the pullbacks into those areas all right it says i have been made the presenter is that kyle over there okay are we ready to switch computers it looks like it this is like a pilot yeah. trying to yeah. switch cockpits in midair you, you have know the, there's you, a you little have the controls, so. Okay, let, let's just give this a go. Let's give this a whirl here. All right, can you hear me? Yes, it's your plane. Please fly. <laughs> <laughs> and don't crash. Don't crash and burn. Okay. All right. We're ready to go. It was a slow day. Let's pick up the action here. Let's, let's speed up the tape one and a half times. So now you can see we clearly broke out. Everybody knows that. And uh, I think we're shutting off the mic over on the other side so you don't have any echo. All right, we had a clear breakout and we came down and we retested and we're still off to the races now. This is something that we see more and more in terms of the efficiency of the market movement once the horse has left the barn. So you tested twice and off to the races. At this point, you don't have any resistance. You only have support underneath down at this 3024 area in general. And that's about all we can say. We've got support at 3024. There's a pocket area at 3042 that's minor support. It hasn't been tested and there's no resistance. And uh, let's go from here. So we were right at this level over here. I'm just going to get out my handy nifty little drawing pen and um, this was our markup period right in here. So we can still draw our pockets because once the market pulls back, we would expect that pocket to hold and initiate from the long side. And my philosophy in trading is you take what the market gives you. If I play this game of buying the pocket or buying the test, Maybe one out of three will be huge trades or at least decent trades. And there's a lot of marginal trades along the way too. And that's where the trade management functions, which we'll talk about at the end of this because there's not necessarily a right or wrong. That's where your skill as a trader is going to come into play. But in the meantime, you put the trade on, and sometimes the market gives you a little, sometimes it gives you a lot. In this place, it gave you a little bit of grief until we finally got that retest, at which point 
we have our first sign of resistance, meaning two data points. All right, so uh, just to advance this one more time. See, I'm on a new computer here. Do I have to? Okay. Aha, it's not going to let me advance this when there's a pen there. Goodness. Okay, make it go away for me. Okay, I'm not going to use that light anymore. So suffice to say, um, we, we found our resistance up here. I've, I've finished enough talk on support and resistance level, and I want to move on, and we're going to start off looking at a mystery chart and ignore my little pink lines there. Just pretend it's a, a, a ribbon for breast cancer. Okay, so we have a mystery chart, and the first thing I want to point out to you on this chart is this far left-hand side of the time, because on the far left-hand side of the chart, because this is probably one of the areas that I see more people get into trouble trading, and it is confusing because you don't see any really clean structure, and I'm talking about all here, this uh, October, November period on our mystery chart. And, you know, this really could be any market, any time frame. It could be a two minute uh, market of the Russell. It could be a uh, an hourly chart of the live cattle. I mean, it could be any type of time series data, in my opinion. But the first thing I want to point out is on this left hand side of the chart, you can see what what I call the creeper mode. And the creeper mode is where the market starts to steadily inch and inch and inch without volatility, okay? And you can have trends continue to be super strong on lighter volume. You know, heavy volume could be an end of the trend, but trends can manifest themselves for quite an extended period on light volume too. I have learned that the hard way too many times. So you see we're still ratcheting, making this pattern of uh, higher lows and higher highs. There's enough volatility here to start drawing a little pocket which I can say to myself, if we traded down into that pocket area, I would want to be a buyer. Uh, however, we, we didn't. We only made a second little pocket area here. And then, of course, we did dip down into sort of the quasi pocket area and formed some better support. So now you can say we've got super strong support because it was tested. You have two lines, relatively horizontal, tested, and uh, and we start to get our, our rising pocket areas. And you'll see when you're in a market and you have a trend and you've got these rising pockets, you could just as easily draw a diagonal line underneath the lows, um, highlighting the channel. So when I do my little rising pockets, it's my version of simply drawing a diagonal trend line. And the reason that I do that instead of drawing a diagonal trend line is that it focuses my eye that this is an area that I want to buy. And, and, you know, sometimes the trend lines are, are poked through or they fall short over a little bit. Um, now you see we've got like one more strong support level that was a nice test. And um, we'll just go on to the next thing there. Oh dear, I'm going backwards. Okay, good thing my colleague has not left yet. Okay, uh, there we go. And it's not, okay, you guys still don't know what this chart is, do you? I hope not. Does anybody have any ideas? Don't, 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 uh, don't let me know if you know exactly what it is. But the point is that you can see our rising pockets continued all the way up 
until we had a pretty good test up here. And yes, there was a little bit of a test up here too. Before we reached that final top, you can see we, we poked up through a couple times and came down. So that could have been forming some initial resistance. Now here's the general rule of thumb on support and resistance levels. And that is that the longer that a price trades around a support level, the greater the odds that it will go through it. And the longer the time that the price trades around a resistance level, the greater the odds that the price will eventually go through it. And that is because all the overhead supply is being absorbed. So in a perfect world, we want our tests of support or resistance to be super quick. And that's why, as a trader, you need to have these levels marked off on your chart ahead of time or be thinking about them in your nightly homework or preparation because they don't necessarily ring the dinner bell when these tests come along. And, uh, you know, if you're not paying attention, especially in the world of the uh, little tape bombs, as I like to call them, um, it's very easy to get shaken out at exactly the wrong spot where you actually should be buying. So keep that in mind. Now you notice the gap area. It's pretty rare that we get a gap area like that on this particular market. And uh, sure enough, the gap area was filled. So we've got our swing highs, our swing lows, our pockets, and our gap areas. And then before this session is through, I'm going to introduce one of the best concepts of all. But here you see that we traded up into the gap area. The purple, again, superlative case of good risk reward. Always so obvious after the fact, right? But we want to be anticipating how will the market act when it gets up to these levels. And then, of course, we formed a pocket right underneath that that was never traded into. And the bottom pocket below that we did test and make a little higher low. And then of course, it just went all goofy until we tested that final last swing low and we could finally draw that bottom line in. But we couldn't call that initial data point on the left-hand side of the chart support until it had really been tested, okay? So you see how all that plays out? And doesn't this chart right here look like it's gonna go on up forever? You don't really see the signs of the top yet. And, and that's why it's, my whole approach to the market is just one day at a time, one bar at a time, because the School of Behavioral Finance will say, how influenced we are by the previous bit of price action. So obviously at this point, people are pretty bullish because that's what the chart and the trend has, but you can also see how quickly that can reverse. And then we get into a big old swinging trading range market. Aha, the secret is revealed. It was a 15 minute coffee chart. Gosh darn it. And uh, you can see the previous now tests, all kinds of little trades that set up around the swing highs and swing lows. And voila, there we got our pocket trade at the far right. That was just with today's action. All right. So all of these are important levels to make note. On a 15 minute coffee chart, you see that maybe we had one important trade or one give me trade a day. Of course, it might have come like when we were sleeping in a different time zone for sure. Um, but I find that as I have gotten older, it has become increasingly more important to be very discriminating about our trade location and where we are anticipating that there might be a potential trade setup and instead not getting reactive. And you know, I will tell you something. I did not make one S&P trade all day today. You know, so sometimes the days are just like that. It was slop and chop, you know, and I traded some other markets, but I, I didn't make one S&P trade all day today. And so that's okay. It's okay if you don't see your spot or your trade, but I really want to draw your awareness to these um, really important swing highs and swing lows. 
now we're going to go on the opposite end of the spectrum. First, we started off with a 240-minute chart of the S&P, and you could see how pretty it was. And then the coffee chart. Now we're down to five-minute data. And this is really important for people that are day traders because you hear so much stuff, and it's stuff about trend following, staying with the trend, blah, 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 okay? But on the short time frames, there's a much greater degree of noise, and we have a lot more counter-trend trading opportunities than you might think, okay? So you still see, I'm not trying to interpret candles here. I don't have any oscillators or moving averages on my chart. I just want to start making note of the key levels where I could anticipate a retest, or, uh, or another trading opportunity. And you see on the left-hand side of the chart where I've got that very first red circle there, I cannot draw that horizontal line yet. I mean, I did that after the fact, after I had two data points, all right? So you can't draw it just off of one data point. It needs to be tested. But I thought it was so interesting on this chart how many times we saw this same level, this 82.52 level tested in the middle of the chart here. And once again, on the far right-hand side to the downside and then to the upside. So these are, these are like, you can get a lot of trading um, information and direction watching how the price trades there. And the whole point is that not to try and pick the bottom as it's going down. You want to actually see a little bit of action where you can then place your stop. And uh, so don't ever think about trying to catch the falling knife. You will see that at the tradable spots, you get a little bit of rotation, a loss in the momentum, we haven't thrown up any oscillators or, you know, stochastics or things like that. And you will see that they can be of value at these times. There are, there's a whole school of people that like to use the bar by bar approach, you know, when it comes down to doing your initial entry level. I don't do that per se, but, you know, um, there's merit in waiting for that first up bar or that first turning point, you know, and we have the other indices and we have ticks and a whole wealth of information. So my main purpose in showing you this chart was, number one, how erratic the data truly is, all right? It's not, it's not this straight line thinking and it does such a disservice to you guys as traders, when you have materials put out there on the internet, especially that are being sold on the internet, and they cherry pick good examples, here's a bull flag, here's a bear flag, here's the Bollinger Band squeeze trade, right? You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. And then you sit down to trade for the day and you get a chart like this. You see, and it's a, it's a different way of thinking. And that's why I think it's very easy to, uh, to get confused, you know, when you look at too much else out there. So go back, try making one big giant chart. Of course, it's helpful if you have two time frames or three time frames, but just make sure you see enough data on your chart that you can note the support and resistance levels. Um, I'm guilty of having a bunch of four inch squares up on a monitor so I can kind of eyeball a 15 uh, markets out of the corner of my eye. And, uh, you know, if something is looking interesting, I always click on it and blow it up because if I don't, I'm sure enough to get suckered into thinking there's something there when it, it's really right in the middle of the trading range and that can be a trap. Okay. So, um, Another just little bit of terminology for you, because this is going to set the stage to what we progress next. And you see these markup periods where we have all these green bars here and all this big green markup here, as well as the big red mark down here. And uh, in market profile or auction theory, 
a lot of times the semantics call those single prints or one time framing, meaning that there's not a whole lot of price bar overlap. And I mention this to you because it's a very seductive feeling if you have caught one of these big whoosh trades up and it feels so good and our first instinct is to immediately look for the bull flag and continuation for yet another leg up and then we're often caught off guard when the consolidation ends up being a lot more uh, contracted and, and keep in mind here this is 24 hour data that I'm showing you so I'm not uh, I'm not staying up all night trading this stuff, but I'm using it for an illustrative purpose, okay? And the point that I want to make that we'll look at in detail in a little bit more is how often these big markups and whooshes down or single time frame prints, if you want to call them that, are actually retested or filled before you have a more stable type of market environment and that's why I wanted to show you that coffee chart in the very beginning where it had that creeper mode and you could see that even though it was low volatility there was a lot of price bar overlap and it gave a very boring steady feeling and that is the type of action that makes a more sustainable trend all right sometimes this is just a little bit over emotional and uh and it can lead to problems so um this swing high over here you can see just a very visible chart point that was tested once again and i don't want to belabor this point of these swing highs and swing lows because i know that you can all study them for yourself but i wanted to show you one more really interesting little trick i talked about this in a previous webinar um it's it's on my youtube video on my website when I was talking about Arthur Sclerou, a classic technician from uh, 70 years ago, and he had a special little trade that he called cross through the box. And on this particular time frame, again, I'm just using this for illustrative purposes because this was in the Asia session when there wasn't huge volume here where I've got this dark blue teal circle. But Let's assume for just um, teaching purposes that this was a daily chart and you had this nice rectangular chart formation with this upside breakout here that of course did a very sharp reversal. So if I'm a student of these support and resistance levels and even in auction theory when you talk about the fat volume nodes where a lot of price trading took place you would expect for the market when it comes back down off of this level to at least find some support in this quasi pocket or the middle of this trading range all right but what happened instead it found zero support so if you if you see a market that drops back down below these previous little resistance levels and into the middle of this chart formation, even if it's a daily chart, the normal expectation would be that it would find some type of initial support in the middle of all this price action. And instead, we had the opposite. So when you slice through the middle of that point, this is going to become very important later on at the end of this presentation. When you slice through this point, it leads to a much better downside than we are expecting. Now, in that webinar that I did on Cross Through the Box with Arthur Sclerou, what he looked for was an equal extension to the opposite end of the side that we did to the upside. So if on this up move we managed to push up, say, uh, 12 handles here, then he would take this low and look for a corresponding 12 handles lower. And of course, we even blasted 
through that and we even blasted through that previous swing low and um, actually it was nice to see it come right back up through it and uh, look where we stopped on that rally so keep in mind on this pre on on this particular slide we're looking at these sharp markup periods and thinking there's pretty good odds at least 66 percent of the time at least that they will be traded back down through it could be in a slow manner or it could be in a very violent manner but it hasn't been a stable enough price action to support a sustainable trend and so now you can see over here this was our cross back down through the box and look at how we have to back and fill the sharp whoosh down here was probably pretty good odds what i like to call a tape bomb okay meaning a tweet about nothing i mean how many tweets can we have about china now guys how many tweets can we have about impeachment it means nothing it means that you have a market that is in a trading range with no higher time frame institutional player and the market's just right for these shakeouts and goosings up and down and you might think that it's just due to trump but i can remember periods where it was arab spring and you would see these things announced on tv or the iraq war there'd be little uh starts of, of phrases on tv and you would get very similar type of price action and in the big scheme of things, it doesn't mean anything. So stay technical. Keep focused on your swing lows and swing highs. Here's another little tip. Sometimes when we find ourselves in more of an emotional state or a reactive mode to the markets, what is your best defense against that? Your best defense is going to be statistics you know write down your swing highs and lows write down your trades write down the levels do a little research how many times does you know have we been able to trade back up after one of these tweets make notes of things like that and then those statistics will be your best friend um i had a, a little thing that i put out on uh, twitter a couple days ago and, and that is that when you're in an uptrend and it really doesn't matter which market it is but if you have a steady uptrending market and you have a morning shakeout or flush for whatever reason a news event that will provide a buying opportunity if however you have an afternoon flush that comes after lunchtime um, those are the ones that you need to be a little bit more careful of and so I just always have to smile when I see the price come back down trade into these pocket areas and test these swing highs and do keep in mind that during the US trading session even on a five minute chart you might only have two or three good opportunities you can see stuff all over this chart but you know this is 24 hour data so i'm just i'm trying to keep it real here for you so let's move on now and i wanted to show you this gold chart because this also was a great example of how we did not find support into a good pocket area and instead sliced through it like a knife a hot knife through butter so gold on the left hand side you see how we can continue to draw these rising pockets and if you prefer to draw a rising trend line more power to you there are no right or wrong tools in this business that is my philosophy if something is not working it's probably going to show up in your bottom line and you either need to do a little bit more research on your methodology or take a little bit better look at your habits it's going to be one of those two things that's holding you back um so you can see that the whole time that gold had this market it wasn't until we tested this level that we could find support and yes we did have a knife through that support and it pop, popped right back up on this first third of the chart 
um, that's just part of the game now. It's not always perfectly defined. That is the noise level, and that is what is segregating, you know, people, like, it, it's segregating uh, the weak hands, and that's the market job. It's not an easy game. Um, that's why you probably have maybe 2% of the people out there that are, you know, making the majority of the money. So um, just keeping it real here, um, what I wanted to show you on this, uh, on this example, we have our well-defined support now because this has been tested several times. You know, the big blast up, it feels so good, and when it feels so good, it's, 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 it's often a climax type of, of action. But we did test that, and what I wanted to show you here was how when we came down off of this top, we sliced right through all this volume area. Normally, uh, the majority of the time, a market will not do that. But when it does do that, very often people are thinking, oh, it's a dip, I can buy the dip. I can buy that pullback. And it's difficult to switch gears mentally and say, the market is telling me something very distinct. Hold on. As a matter of fact, that was Terry Lieberman from Window Trader. He probably has no idea that I mentioned his name and his ears were ringing. Okay, but back to what I was talking about, switching mentally the momentum. And you, if you're just watching your screen like a television set and watching the price action, of course it's a big whoosh down, but you haven't fully let go of the fact that gold is in an uptrend, let's buy dips, okay? It might take a little bit more to convince you otherwise, unless you're very astute and you were waiting for the resistance and perhaps you're looking at daily charts and other factors or variables. I'm just pointing out some of the traps that I see newer people get caught up in and I wanna show you the implications then. Obviously, it's, it's very nice to have these little divergences on any type of stochastic or moving average oscillator. But another thing that I wanna make perfectly clear is that at the good swing highs and the good swing lows, you might only get a lovely momentum divergence a small percentage of the time. You go and investigate that for yourself. There's a lot of sloppy, uh, dull bottoms. There's a lot of test reject spiky bottoms. In a perfect world, yes, we would have little uh, divergences at the tops and bottoms of the swings and life would be easy. So we sliced through this, ratcheted down, and now we're even a bit below this previous support level not a great sign. So this is where we slice down through the support level and you can see that it set the tone for gold for the next couple weeks, right? Okay, it was looking so good and feeling so good till we had that one key bar that took out all those buyers and all that support. Now, what I've done here is I've marked off with these rectangular squares the parts that I talked about that are the single prints. And you have to think about these areas as gap areas. I know they're not gap areas, but they're the same type of price behavior. I have a friend who trades strictly off of using the volume distribution, such as one would see on a market profile type of software. And he likes to look for these areas and call them cave fills. So I'll do another webinar or presentation for Big Mike or uh, on my own website. If you go there and sign up for webinars, I'll do one specifically on cave fills for you because it's an important concept. But for now, I'll just show it in a different manner of marking off the rectangles where we had this big whoosh up. You see on the far left, I've got that first rectangle and we come back down and we fill it. 
And now we have this big whoosh down. Think of it as a gap area. I've got a giant rectangle, and it wasn't partially filled until later on. And you can see how we can play this game back and forth. Now we've got another big rectangle, and it only led to a partial trade up into that area here. Most of these other rectangles, think of them as common gaps, where it's not unusual that the market is going to go back down and retest them. So, so far, I hope I've opened your eyes into a different world of looking at structure on the chart that's not my usual manner of doing zigzags with the swing highs and swing lows. I'm not going into the indicators that are the derivatives of price, although I do have a stochastic at the bottom here. It's very important to mark off these high and low levels. And here I actually put this line in yellow because it was tested through so many times. So that's a really important area, that 1519 in the gold. And now we're going to blow it up big, 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 big picture. You can see our yellow line up at the top there where we tested so many times and could not get through. And where did we fall back down to just two days ago? You can't see it if you have a little square on your chart, but it was this previous resistance area that now got tested as support and this was an extremely interesting buying area in gold. I don't know if it'll get legs and trade back up above that 1480 area or not, but you can see what a great risk reward point it was at that time. And then of course our first stopping point was that previous low. And it all started, all this horrible, nasty, wretched action started with the market telling us with this big bar down, not finding support in that pocket. Okay, I promised you some easy little time of day tricks and I'm gonna show you my favorite two trades, actually three or four trades. I got lots of favorite trades. I only show you my trades that make money, though. I'm not going to show you my trades that, that lose money. And um, But this is a good, good pattern to have in your arsenal, especially if you're a newer trader, because now we're going to look at a time of day function as well as a level. And I will always do this trade. So the trade is simple. You can see on my circle on the left-hand side of the chart, that was the day's opening. We didn't even trade below the low of that first five-minute bar. I could talk for three hours on how the price trades around that first five-minute bar, but if you do not see it take out the low of that bar within the first 15 minutes, pretty good odds you'll have a nice upswing. And surely we did. We had a super nice upswing. And I I'm not going to analyze anything more of this chart other than the fact that I had a sell stop below the low of that five minute bar there. It's just a scalp. It doesn't mean that you don't have a short position on for other things too. You can have multiple trades on at one time, multiple shorts or multiple longs, but I will always have a sell stop below the low of this bar. And here you can see that uh, it, it only led to about four handles down, uh, and five handles if you were super fast. I think we pulled out like, uh, you know, seven ticks, nothing, nothing to write home about, but it's a gimme. It's like a 90% type of trade. And the best way that I would advise to manage that trade is to scale out, take partial. And what you will find is if you do that trade over and over, one out of every 10 trades can be a huge home run, all right? Unfortunately, uh, it, you know, they all can't be that way, but it's 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 a good trade to make. And and of course, you see that we finished the day closing uh, closing up there. It's just a scalp trade, but I wanted to give you something to go on.
that makes you aware of the morning high and low. In other words, the high and low, that's the US session while Europe is open. Right now we're in a little funky daylight savings time warp thing, but I always think of the US session in two parts, the morning session and in the afternoon session. And there's a lot of validity to the fact that if a market is making new highs or new lows in that afternoon session, it has follow through. Although in this particular trade, uh, it was just a scalp only. But here is the opposite type of trade. S&P, no indicator. All I'm doing is buying if it makes new highs in the afternoon. Now, where do you want to put your initial stop? There's not a right or wrong or this. You know, a lot of people like to put their stop below the low of a five minute bar. I always have a default stop that goes in. It's just a fixed amount that uh, is not too tight, not, not too, too wide. Um, and it's automatic, it's on my platform. So every time I enter a trade, you know, it's like an automatic stop goes in of $500 per contract. And then I can, I can tighten it or adjust it as I see fit and, and scale out. So here you see, once again, we had a winning trade in the afternoon. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's follow through into the next day, but I wanted to give you some simple workable ideas that you can take home with you that you don't have to pay $49.99 for, okay? You know, <laughs> they're just nice little scalps. And I'm gonna show you a different idea. That is report bars. This was one that happened today in natural gas, so I just snagged it on the fly. But it's also really important to note the highs and lows if there's a big event bar. This was the natural gas number coming out um, in this particular case where I've got the blue arrow drawn, that was the release of the natural gas part. I'm not going to go into trading any other structure on this thing. All I want to do is say, put a high at the opposite end of that report bar. It was a down bar. Put a buy stop above the high of that bar because if it gets taken out, it'll get a goosing. And you can see, it didn't lead to a whole lot of here. I think we took 10 ticks out of this. That's nothing like to write home about, but it's $100 per contract. And once in a while, you will catch a real tiger by the tail. That's the name of the game. We cannot predict where the big wins and the big losers are going to come from. But I want like surefire entries where at least I stand a fighting chance of getting something and it's pretty well defined. Now I'm gonna give you one last idea here. I'm trying really hard guys to keep this simple and not muddle your brain because this is stuff that if you've been in the markets for a year or less that you can be thinking about, the, the support and the resistance and the basics, but equally important, if you've been trading for 30 years, bring it back home, you know, revisit the basics. And uh, it, it's a very refreshing exercise to do. So now I wanted to show you another little interesting thing with the pit session only, not pit per se, but I like to start my trading day off with that 7 a.m. Central Standard Time type of uh, open. And the reason I use that is eight o'clock Eastern time basis, New York. That's when a lot of the old bond guys and desk guys and institutional guys come and sit down at their desks. Of course, we've got quantitative firms that run stuff 24 seven now, but most people are looking at the, the markets in this time frame because it's only a half an hour till the economic reports are released, which can cause a lot of activity. So when I sit down, it kind of gives me a little chance to see how Europe traded and so forth. And on my chart, now this is CQG, but you can do the exact same thing with TradeStation or just about any software out there. I put little bands that are the first 
15 minute range. This is just 15 minute. You can do it with five minute. You can do it with anything you want. And in the good old days, this was called the initial balance, which is not so clean as it used to be, but it's still a valid concept, you know, breaking out of that a little bit of initial trading range. And what I wanted to show you here was with the bonds, these gap areas that are formed by the pit session trading only. And you will see this in the crude oil, you'll see it in gold, you will see it in the currencies. And it is astounding how many times these gaps are traded back into, just like we would expect the single prints, all right? You can make note of them you know, by looking at the pit session data. Now here in the bonds, I thought this was such a cool example because we broke from this top and if you are familiar with the auction theory concepts, we get several types of action that can unfold over a day. And one of those types of actions is open drive. It doesn't happen that often you can get open rotate, you know, open test, reject where you make that V and that morning reversal is your uh, initial uh, counter trend trade. So here these last two days was more of a case of open drive to the downside in a sharp downtrend. And once we've left that downtrending environment, now we have our state change and this is what a big part of trading is about is recognizing the changing of the states from the trending market to the quote balancing or bracketing market or trading range environment substitute whichever semantics you choose but you're forming a little bit of a base if you will or consolidation and from there of course you can still continue lower or of course you can continue higher. And today, what I wanted to point out to you was from this base that we formed a couple days ago, we traded up to 158.28 basis, the December bonds, which traded and closed this gap area. You see, so these are really important levels, just as our horizontal lines are, just as market profile types of um, value area, you know, concepts are. It's all about the levels. And when I used to be in the trading pit, that was all we had was the price. We didn't have the charts. And so you're always thinking in your head, okay, 39 and an eighth, 39 and a quarter. Okay, I remember yesterday we traded down to 38 and a half. Okay, you know, the high for the week was 40. And I think that we were a little bit more number oriented. And I want people to bring that back into your consciousness, not just a bunch of squiggly lines and oscillators and, and trend lines, but really think about what was yesterday's high? What was yesterday's low? What is the level that we could trade down to? Okay, so let me just sum this up really quickly for you. The things that I value most, and this is just what works for me, and that's what's so cool about this process. Everybody has their own journey, and, and it's all about you finding what's going to work for you. So maybe you might only take just one or two pieces of the things that work for me. Oh, and by the way, stick with me. I'm almost through, but at the very end, I have a special surprise for you that we worked all day long on getting for you, okay? So just hang tough just a little bit more. Okay, price, the oscillators, you can see we did not go into oscillators and all that stuff today and I have done that ad nauseum and I created a YouTube channel on my website where you can watch this stuff forever and ever and moving averages have their use. Obviously, volume today was a classic example of a lower volume day and it was a chop chop day. If you want more information on market profile, 
my husband Damon just did a fabulous webinar yesterday that he is happy to email to you um, if you go down to that little website or that little email at the bottom Damon at fptrading.net and that is using the window trader software but honestly you can use any uh, market profile software and you don't even need the market profile software I promise if you see one of these webinars you'll get the main idea the main principle of it and it will just add another layer of lightning I do not recommend market profile for newer people that have been in the markets just for a, a year or less because you still need to navigate your way around concrete pivots the absoluteness of a high or a low the absoluteness of an opening price the absoluteness of the gap areas and with market profile you start to allow a lot of gray area into your interpretation if you are not as experienced so just be aware of that uh, you know it's walk before we run now two last things I just wanted to drill home to you I can't say it enough about the importance of recognizing how these state changes in a market catch people off guard for example on this copper chart it really truly looked and this is a daily chart seriously daily bars are not supposed to have this much noise but on this daily chart it really looked like a gorgeous upside breakout and remember what I showed you on a five minute Nasdaq chart on the 240 minute gold chart that when you take out the middle of that trading range as we did right through here you better reverse your mental state of thinking and it is one of the hardest things to do I promise I have a difficult time doing it it is one of the hardest things to do how do we deal with that statistics or something that's quantifiable the only way I know of is by saying okay we extended out the upside by this amount here it's possible that we can come out to the downside by this amount here you see now you have put it into a structural framework and of course we went much lower too but it's going to keep you from getting into trouble thinking oh this is a support here it's a support I should try buying these lows hold the pocket it diced right through this big fat volume node on fat bar and that's so much for the copper market natural gas who would have ever been able to predict that once we did this top you're back into that same old thing of let me buy the pullback let me buy the pullback without understanding the reversal of the momentum this market should not have come back down into this range here on the left okay and even here it had this big goosing up but this went on to make new contract lows so it's my job to point out to you um, I know you know how many ways you can get into trouble I don't need to talk about that <laughs> you know but my point is that we cannot see these things we cannot forecast them you can only frame things out by the swing highs and swing lows and gap areas that may or may not be filled pocket areas if this market truly was going to uh, hold after it closed its gap back down here and, and this is looking like a nice little island at the time um, it would have it would have had to have hold this pocket here all right so there's a whole different school that we can frame out working with when do we short these swing lows and when do we short these swing highs and I'll show you just a little bit about how we go that to conclude our presentation now this is another case where um, 
we do have quantifiable tools to indicate the reversal of momentum all right um, this was a tough one for a lot of people because it still felt like you had to short that reaction up whereas instead we had sentiment extremes and then on the short-term basis we were making new momentum highs and, and then eventually a higher high in price. And I'm not going to belabor that, but there's no indicator that you could have looked at at this time that would have said, oh, that's a bottom per se. Most of the indicators that are derivatives of price were still looking for some type of flagging action, not understanding that climax V. And you can create a, uh, strategies that capture that climax V. So let me just show you one last little teaser here. This is a momentum-based system. We see all kinds of things out there on the internet that look like this, you know, with the little arrows, seductive by seductive cells. Even this cell at the bottom of this V did get a reaction down. A lot of them are based off of simple things like an RSI, uh, you know, uh, and, and they'll show you these phenomenal track records, how all you have to do is sit on an island and run this little printing press and just buy my system for $169 and I'll throw in the bonus free report, all right? And here's another one It works. It's like, wow, it even works here on this type of data, except there's one or two losers, we see, uh, okay, one, two, three big wins, four big wins. Ah, it's okay to have a loser there, right? That's okay. It's okay to have a loser there, right? Because I'm going to make it back up on the wins. This is pretty typical of a trading system that has been a little bit curve fitted. All right. And we can even see that, look, it works on other markets as well. It has to be durable and robust. Okay. And then we hit a period like this, and it's not going to work on anything. I mean, we'll have uh, 10 times more losers than we will winners. And, it, oh, yes, here's a winner over here. But meanwhile, you don't have any capital left. All right. So my main point is that everything is dependent upon the context. And the more experience you get as a trader, the better you are able to put things into a context or a state. Technical analysis is about defining risk. It is not about predicting or forecasting, all right? No indicator out there has been statistically significant as a forecasting tool other than just on a very short-term time horizon. You have to think about that and take that to heart. Even if we look at the most lucrative, profitable hedge funds in the entire world, and in fact, there was just a book that came out about Jim Simmons, the medallion, uh, the Renaissance Fund, okay? Renaissance is the name of his company. It was the medallion fund, probably the most spectacular uh, risk adjusted performance that that mankind has ever seen all 100% systematic algo based 24 7 and what people don't realize is that the average holding time of those trades is less than 12 hours I haven't read the book so I can't say I do know somebody that used to uh, be on an execution desk for him. I know I have friends that were invested in his funds and fund to fund managers that were invested with the fund, but very short holding time. Same thing with some of the, you know, the funds like Toby Craybell's fund, his average holding time under 24 hours. At least that's what it used to be 15 years ago. I couldn't speak for how it is now. And so people think that, oh, this long-term trend following is the secret to the riches. But in fact, the people that have pulled the most amount of monies out of the marketplace actually have a very short holding time. You or I cannot do that because we don't have the infrastructure built to uh, manage that type of data. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
Okay, and you saw that NASDAQ chart with those five-minute whipsaws and stuff. I'm just saying. And so as a parting shot, let me just give you one more thing to go to because, you know, I have to leave you coming back for the next webinar, right? Hopefully uh, Big Mike will have me on again. I've been a friend of, of uh, Mike and Terry for many, many, many years. Fine, fine people. And uh, so here we have dollar data. And it's kind of, we can do our horizontal lines and look at levels. Certainly we can see plenty of levels by which to look at support and resistance levels here. And then we can even go so far as to connect the swing highs and swing lows. And you see how this now creates an entirely different type of structure than the horizontal lines that I just spent an hour going over. And now we can strip away the bar charts and only look at the swing highs and swing lows and start to come up with patterns in the structure, okay? I'm not satisfied with this yet because this is uh, just a, um, a bit of data, but if I now look out the long time horizon and clean it up, now we can start to see a different type of style of trading such as the coils that can form from the swings. And so this will be uh, when we graduate from um, kindergarten and first grade, which we were in today, and trust me, you can make a lot of money as a first grader. You can make a lot of money taking scalps on those new highs and new lows in the afternoon session. You can take a lot of money looking at the tests of those supports and resistances. But this now is, is where we can eventually move on to in your progression as a trader. And like I said, uh, ultimately, that auction theory may add a bit more understanding on top of that. I do not advise starting out with that, though. I still, don't leave me yet because, wait, I've got a bonus for you, okay? Yeah, yeah, no, this is how we like to think, our linear thinking, right? You know, in a cyclical world, and we already know that there are fat tails and there's not geometry and, and uh, calculus equations that solve the market. So I don't need to say that. And I did have one last thing that I want to emphasize to you that I found in this talk from 1996 by Bill Eckert, who was actually Richard Dennis's partner. And Eckert was really the genius behind a lot of the model and statistical testing that they did. But what he said that really caught my attention was that your liquidations, your exits, and your trade management are going to be vastly more important than your initiations. And so um, you can go back and, and read this or, 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 or capture that at a later point. Richard Feynman is my hero. It was absolutely the best book that I read when it first came out. The dear man has passed, but he actually has a Twitter feed in his honor where you'll get wonderful little quotes. And this is how I feel in the markets. You know, I have an idea, I have a level, but I'm never 100% sure about anything. If you like my talk, I'm going to give a one minute shout out to my book where you can go and read the first chapter um, on my website. Um, it took me about three years to write this book, and I tried to sum up all my pearly words of wisdom and funny experiences and very sad, tragic experiences, um, but how you survive those as a trader because uh, they, they happen. Um, and then lastly, I worked all day long with our website developer because it was so slow today to give you a free ebook. And this ebook here, which if you click on it, hopefully the link works. If not, it should work tomorrow. But um, it's a series of articles. I think I've got 11 articles in there that I've written over the years that I thought would um, be of most value to you in emphasizing the things about a trading foundation. 
and you will find that it's not necessarily about the technicals and the cutesy little strategies and, and so forth, but it's very much about the mindset, the mental mindset, um, the building blocks to get there, you know, the foundation and the process and the rituals. And uh, so with that, I sincerely apologize about the little technical snafus in the beginning, but I hope it was worth your while to hang in there. And I have time for questions. And it might just be, you have to type them to me. Okay. Are you there? Yep. Oh. Sorry, uh, I lost you for a second. All right, there we go. See, I had to switch over to Kyle's thing. Okay. So questions. The pocket. What is a pocket again? Think about when you have an uptrend and we're simply looking at the little dip. Okay, so for example, in this chart right here, you can see we've been in a downtrend, and this is the pocket that then served resistance. So you can ultimately draw this trend line down. I'm going to find you an even better example here. Uh, go back. These are the little pockets. They're, they're where the market pulled back, and next time it pulls back, it might not pull back all the way down to that swing low. It might just pull back and make a higher low, and that's what forms the trend. So these pockets are not quite the swing highs or swing lows, but the little trading ranges that formed around those. Okay. I'm just going to have to blow this up here. Um, Somebody was asking about Al Brooks course, if I think it's a good foundation for a beginner. I can't answer that because different things work for different people. I will tell you something wonderful about Al because I've had friends that have listened to him. And I think the very most important thing that he can teach you is that he stays in the moment. Um, I've never subscribed to his class, but I've seen uh, I've seen uh, two or three um, uh, sessions, and you notice he's he's normally not thinking far ahead or are we bullish or are we bearish. He kind of frames things out where it leaves an open mind on both sides. Well, the bulls would want to see this. The bears would want to see that, you know, that type of thing. So he keeps an open mind and he tries to follow the market's action. And I think that's one of the most important lessons that you can learn. Um, so you can always try that and see that if, if it works for you. Um, I will comment that with this uh, quote, bar by bar price action, bar action theory, I've probably seen more newer traders just get chopped up to smithereens because being able to watch five minute candlestick charts is very much about putting things into context. So I'm sure that if you watched somebody like Al or, or, or a good educator, um, over time, if you did nothing but just watch for three months, your understanding of context and environment would increase tenfold. But until you have that background of being able to put things into context, like today was a very low volume uh, trading day, we could see that right at the beginning of the day and it was going to make it very difficult for the market to get too far in either direction. So until you really understand that context, it's, it's very easy just to get whipsawed and you can have a lot of little nicks. You're probably not going to lose your capital, but you can you can bleed quite a lot, you know, <laughs> taking uh, small losses here, small losses there, small losses here, and it then tends to erode your confidence. So, um, you know, uh, I, I know he has a lot of integrity, and, and I, I, can, I can say that. Let me see. 
I'm trying to open up these question box here. All right. Okay. I said that the majority of people that makes the most profits don't hold trades for longer than 12 hours. No, that is not what I said. I said that the funds, the quantitative funds that pull the most profits out of the marketplace, billions and billions and billions of dollars are being extracted on a very short time frame. Billions more money than has ever been made by trend followers, okay? And uh, I'm very curious to read that Jim Simmons book. I think, I don't know if it was the Wall Street Journal or some some somewhere there was an article that was just written on him. If you Google Jim Simmons article, you'll find it. And that's the Renaissance Medallion Fund. And uh, I know of at least 15 funds out there that have billions of dollars. Um, there's one over in the, I'm not going to name it where it is, but um, from what I understand, they've not had a losing day. But, you know, it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a big numbers game that you and I could never repeat because it's based on making thousands of trades with a very small edge and that gets a super high confidence factor up where you're almost guaranteed a profit. So that is what uh, what I was really saying there. Let's see. Dark pools, I don't get into dark pools at all and that's a moot issue um, for futures traders. Uh, don't don't bother uh, with that. You know, I'm I can only deal with my game. I can't deal with uh, you know what are the high frequency algorithms doing now or not. You know, at a big level, it's not going to be important. You know, because it's the higher time frame player, if you will. You know, that's really making those massive uh, decisions of uh, when to change their asset allocation for the trillions of dollars that are out there, you know, maybe start lightening up on the fangs, which could take them weeks to reduce their position size down by 5% and, and start allocating into a different sector. These are just monstrous amounts of, of money out there. So um, I can only deal with which you know, what, what works for me and in my limited scope. And uh, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that you don't need dark pools and algorithms and fancy gizmos and stuff to make a good living. It takes more a concentration on looking at the levels, understanding support and resistance. Being patient for your trade is probably the hardest thing out there. Um, you know, I'm always noting when I do my homework coming in in the morning, I'm making note of the high and the low for the day. And um, I'm making note of the high and the low for the day and the overnight uh, highs and lows and where the gaps are. And I'll tell you, that can give you plenty of material to, to go off of. Um, and, and the, there's a question here on how do you maintain a calm demeanor and, and so forth. Um, <laughs> well, if you read my book, uh, Trading Sardines, you will read about when I threw a clock through the closet door and uh, found out that that closet door was hollow and it left a big giant hole. So I, I've had my share of uh, moments, if you will. But the under the, the thing you also understand is that the longer that you are in, uh, the more experience that you have, the thicker skin that you get. And it just takes time. So just be patient. I mean, I, I can see these poker players who sit at these card tables for these million dollar pots. And they are so cool as cucumbers. But they probably weren't that way the first year or two they were playing. They'd get their feathers ruffled a little bit and make mistakes. And I, I'm sure it's that way with professional athletes, with uh, with a lot of different disciplines. Um, 
for me, I also find it really important to do something physical. You know, you have to release the stress. You're sitting here for long periods of time. You know, get up and walk around. You know, keep a 10 pound or 20 pound dumbbell in your office. You know, occasionally jump up and down. Um, so do things like that because otherwise it is easy to get snow blind. All right, you know what I mean? Like the charts just start to all blur together. And my friend Terry Lieberman says that you really can't go more than 90 minutes of concentrating at a time. So that's why I like to break the day up into these little sessions. And uh, I, I, I promise if you go to my website, you'll see a little thing that says sign up for uh, free webinars and stuff. And, and I'm going to do more on this because especially uh, on how to set up the structure for the day, it's, it's helpful for people. I'm not giving away any huge trade secrets here. So uh, just, to, you know, anything that gives you a little bit of a confidence or shortens your learning curve, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you have further questions, you know, I do answer all my emails. You'll see a little contact me form on my website. Uh, don't ask me what I see for the rest of the year. That's a pointless question. I'm just trying to make money the next day. And I love the S&Ps and the gold and the crude oil. And I love the bonds when I'm making money and I hate them when I'm losing money with them. So I'm like anybody else you know I, I like the markets that I'm in sync with you know right now it's a uh, it's coffee and sugar you know I, I have a an affinity for coffee and sugar and I'm I'm currently uh, avoiding the hogs so uh, the Feynman book you can just google that and I'm sure you'll find it it's it's just it was an autobiography that he he wrote, but he had a, a ghost writer help, uh, help write him with it. And, and then hopefully I'll be able to do a webinar uh, in just maybe uh, 10, 10 days. I'll try and get it in uh, before Thanksgiving for you, okay? All right, and I know that that uh, I love your guys' comments. Xanax wine, yay, yay! All right, I, I I know you guys are all the best. Thank you for sticking around. Do love my my little free ebook thing because we worked really hard to put that together for you guys. And feel free to pass it around. I really don't care, you know. And uh, God bless you. And have a good trading day tomorrow. And thank you to Mike and Terry for the phenomenal phenomenal job that they do on hosting their site. They offer so many resources out there for free. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hello, Terry. You can come back now. Can you hear me now? I, I hope I didn't put him to sleep. Can you hear me now? I will go all the way back to my special departing thing, and you can see right there where to download your free ebook.